Getting to that, though, the, our, we've watched the evolution of the diagnostic criteria from Poser to McDonald, and of course, everybody at the beginning said MRI is just not diagnostic, and now look what's happened. So, Tony, how do you think um, these proposed changes are going to help? Because there is a lot of misdiagnosis of MS, and we know that now in a couple of papers Dr. Solomon just recently presented at Ectrams. But the question is, how can we firm up the diagnosis by teaching people how to use the McDonald and MRI appropriately? Because it, it's certainly not happening in this country with 25% misdiagnosis. And um, I think it's important to realize MRI is not diagnostic. It's supportive of the diagnosis. It has to be in the appropriate clinical context when we're interpreting the MRI. And so uh, where some of the misdiagnoses have occurred is when um, the criteria were applied without the without the accurate or the appropriate clinical symptoms for the patients. And the, the criteria really developed in a classic syndrome, it's called a clinically isolated syndrome of optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, and, um, and applied to that population is highly accurate in terms of making that early diagnosis. And so one thing all of us have emphasized in our different uh, publications and guidelines is when the patient profile is a little atypical, you must be much more cautious when applying these criteria and, and collect more information such as spinal fluid analysis or monitor the patient over time. But uh, what's nice about the MRI protocols um, that have been developed is they're perfect for applying the McDonald criteria. They, they include sufficient quality to um, detect dissemination space and dissemination in time with the characteristic lesions as well as the enhancing lesions. So it's the perfect protocols for making that early diagnosis. One thing I loved when I was in the clinical area is that how we spelled out how the report should read. And that's something, remember we had laid out with the report, not just MS, and which is something that people were confronting and of course the radiologists are not supposed to make the diagnosis, but I think our, our guideline hopefully will help guiding, guide that uh, diagnostic process back to the neurologist where it really belongs. Um, I think yesterday we were also talking about how the, um, you know, using contrast gadolinium could increase the efficiency of using MRI diagnosis. I don't know if David or Frederick wants to comment on that, but um, it does make it a lot faster and only needing one scan. Yeah, to make a diagnosis, yeah, to, so, so by showing multiple lesions in various compartments of the brain, so juxtacortical, periventricular, infratentorial, and cord lesions, you show the dissemination in space. But if one of those is enhancing, you know, you know it's a recent lesion and the others are, are old, so then by definition you have the dissemination in time. Just with one single scan and you can proceed to, to treatment decisions uh, if you think that's relevant. Yeah, and that's without having to do a lumbar puncture. And right. I think the what I like about the new guidelines, McDonald criteria, um, is that different from the old criteria, if you have an enhancing lesion that is the symptomatic lesion, yeah. you can make a diagnosis, which I, that I was actually something really that caused like. enormous amount of confusion. You know, what is the symptomatic lesion? It's often difficult to determine. Yeah, yeah. And we got rid of that uh, because after the last iteration of the McDonald criteria, a lot, lot of research was done to see where it made a difference, and in fact, it doesn't. And that simplified things a lot uh, and makes it much easier to assert in the dissemination in space and time. And it definitely reinforces the earlier discussion that we had about the use of gadolinium. It's, everything that we do is always a balance between risk and benefit. And uh, we are obviously wanting to be sure that the gadolinium deposition is not producing any problems with it, but the opposite side of not using gadolinium is you have the risk of missing the diagnosis earlier yeah. of the disease. So it's always that balance that we have to work with, and, and uh, certainly this is a case where by showing the gadolinium enhancement on that early scan, you can make that diagnosis on that very first scan. Yeah, the one challenge that I remembered clinically was that the um, units, the radiology units would say, I don't want to wait for that delay, you know, because sometimes, you know, we, I know our original, and I think we haven't changed it yet, once you inject, there has to be a little time before you rescan them. And the units say, we don't have that time, we want that patient on and off the table. So it's going to take a lot of education like this program to convince people that gadolinium has value. And unfortunately, time is money in many of those units. So uh, we still have a job to do to get out there and educate. And I guess today is day one of re re-educating people out there. The other thing is that I was just going to interrupt oh, yeah, June. Go. Yeah, and, go ahead. And, you know, the, the issue about the time between 
that we have to wait for the gadolinium is solved in that now we recommend that um, during that time that you're waiting, the five to 10 minutes, you can actually do se other sequences. So for example, the flare sequence that is indispensable for the use that we have most commonly is done during that time between injection and when you actually do the post gadolinium scan. And in fact, my experience, uh, I'd be interested to hear what you say, but very often the enhancement is very clearly seen on the flare scan and, yeah, and makes it yeah. even more confident because you have two scans that show the enhancement. Uh, I agree, I agree. Well, that's why we need education because people are just, uh, they're thinking they have to take the patient, let them wait. And if you can do the flare and our users, little, uh, viewers out there are gonna hear this. So that's important. It probably should be in the printed uh, version of this. And we need yeah. to disseminate this more because the technologists really are not exposed to education the way the neuroradiologists are, the radiologists, and they're just handed a prescription, you know, with the guideline and they say, whoops, it's too much time.